You are listening to The Worlding Podcast, where we explore the relationship of how we are both, shaping and being shaped by our surroundings. The podcast traces interconnections by inviting each episode's guest to pass on the mic to someone who has influenced their world. And now, here's your host, dance artist Renee Schadler. Hello, friends. Today we begin our 11th string figure with my guest, Oliver T., a visual artist working at the intersection of art and science. I had the pleasure of seeing two of Ollie's exhibitions, firstly in 2020 at Tia and Natomisch's Theater Berlin and in November 2022 at Haunt Berlin. Both explored non-human subjects through the use of transparent paper, which acted as a membrane. Today we dive into Ollie's process and how this can encourage more than human relations. Thanks so much for chatting with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for the invite, Renee. And I'm looking forward very much to our conversation. To begin, can you tell myself and listeners about your current surroundings and how they are shaping you at this moment? Yeah, uh, you're catching me here in my studio apartment, which is uh, located in Berlin, Schöneberg. Uh, in, it's, it's on the fourth floor, so I'm having a great view when I look out of the window there is no building uh, in front of me and I can see those uh, poplar trees there in the back. And now at the beginning of winter, they stand there already without any leaves and they are giving me a certain graphical uh, impression, which I like very much. And uh, again, coming back to the room, um, I'm standing here on my desk uh, in the office area of my apartment. Uh, the desk is white and across there is a little drawer with um, very uh, small drawers um, where I keep my papers in. And, and on top of this, there's a, a plant with big, uh, very dark green leaves. And next to it, I have some like uh, lab materials. There's a little microscope and forceps and little glasses, um, stuff like that. Uh, and behind me on the wall, I used to hang up little drawings that um, uh, are just uh, from my process, current process. And one of them is super black, um, very dark. And it's a, a totally thin, um, like a skin, which is so delicate that it can hang just on one magnet. Wow. So a lot of materials and different devices for looking at objects. I know this is very much a part of your process, spending a lot of time with objects that you choose to study and I'm interested in your approach as an artist because following your work over the years, I've noticed that this is very different to a scientific approach. So could you share a little bit more about this artistic approach as opposed to an scientific approach? So in my practice through, throughout the years, um, I used to collaborate again and again with um, scientists from different disciplines, different fields. And I had the opportunity to work closely in like interdisciplinary teams, constellations. Um, so I got to know pretty precisely how they work and how they perceive the objects where we collaborated about. And um, yeah, to compare this with my approach, the most general difference might be that um, they are looking 
at the obs uh, objects of, of observation um, more in a generalistic way. They tend to schematize them quickly so they um, can answer some pre-prepared hypothesis um, and they're not so much focusing on the actual individual which is there in front of us. Every whatever uh, thing we are looking at, a um, natural um, piece from nature, an animal or plant or something like that, um, is for them, uh, in many cases, um, it's more like a um, representative of a species or of a class of things where they can quickly move from into this generalistic uh, overview idea. This process of studying the individuality of things is very evident in your exhibition, The Truth About the Origin of the World, which I saw in 2020. And in this exhibition, there were 46 images of the shadows of stones from an 18th century stone collection from the Seven Mountains, the Siebengebirge in the Rhineland. How was it for you spending time with this collection and deciding on the shadows you decided to capture in your drawings? Yeah, in, in this project, I um, collaborated with a historian and we were both looking at this um, rock collection that you mentioned, which is nowadays um, housed in the Berlin Natural History Museum there in, the, in their mineral department. And I worked with them actually uh, over the course of two years. And I established a method of capturing their shadows. Because um, just in a playful experiment, I found out when placing one piece, one stone onto an overhead projector, it threw, of course, it threw its shadow onto the wall. But this shadow, it, um, yeah, it reveals a char characteristic of the stone which is not so obvious when you just look at the actual piece because this one this is three dimensional and is its color has colors and many aspects that draw your attention away from this uh, like core ca characteristic that the reduction of the shadow now it's just black and flat and no inside structure, there's just the outside form. This makes it very obvious and um, it just jumps out what is the typical uh, about this piece. Yeah, and then I also established a special kind of drawing method to uh, catch the shadow. You already mentioned the transparent paper. Here, this comes into play here. Um, so I use a super thin kind of transparent paper and I cover it completely with soot. So this flame created black smoke um, coming from a petroleum lamp. Um, and I, so I black out the whole paper, but the suit, it just set, sits on the paper very softly. It creates a very delicate thin layer, which um, goes away on the lightest touch. And there I projected my shadow on. So the shadow came onto the suit surface and now I uh, like, um, yeah, I went into the role of the light because I took away all the suit outside of the shadow. It, it's a, a re reductible um, way of drawing. And I take it away with different brushes 
softly touching the suit, which then, yeah, uh, flies flies off somehow, um, so that I can like dig out the the silhouette. And this is the result that you saw in the exhibition. And I did this for all the normally 46 pieces in this collection. But six of them, they are nowadays lost somehow. They couldn't find their way into the collection of the museum here. Um, so I left six empty sheets into the constellation uh, on the wall in this exhibition. Yeah. Hmm. It really, for me, sounds like a welding practice in this way you're shaping and being shaped by your surroundings, and particularly in this moment, the stone. I am really curious about this practice of time, spending time and working with light, which again is a reminder of time, the rising and setting of the sun, and these two years of coexisting with this stone collection. Did you find, Ollie, that this process over the two years also influenced your emotional state or the way you were looking at stones perhaps that made up a road or stones that were in your local park? Yeah, of course, it did in a way that I now know that there can be like hidden characteristics in objects so anonymous like uh, stones um, and from the tra transition to their shadow, they can become now like like characters in, in a theater play or, which present themselves in a yeah characteristic way. Um, but um, important here is that at the end I focus more on the shadow as a, a phenomena than I focused on the actual stone. Because, you know, in that process I'm completely turning my back to to the stone because it's behind me on the projector and I turn to the wall where the shadow is and um, a shadow, I mean every object can cast a shadow but then somehow shadows, they become an object for themselves. Um, maybe this is some some kind of phenomena which connects every object. Um, and this, the phenomenological characteristics of the shadow again, what was what become interesting to me. Um, as I mentioned already, the, yeah, the flatness and um, the, yeah, the, just black in, inner structure with no structure in, inside the form makes uh, the rim so important. So I focus so much um, uh, on the structure of this border between light and shadow. And as I um, explained in, in this, um, yeah, in this technique of taking away the suit which is in the light um i yeah the this border zone became very physical to me i was touching it with my brushes i approached this rim slowly taking away the outside suit until i reach that border and i actually be, uh, began to feel it so the shadow somehow it became a bit less ephemeral to me um, but then the transparent paper is again important to express still that uh, ephemerality um, because here I feel that this this 
super thin skin of the transparent paper. It's there in, in space like a skin where that fleeting phenomena of the shadow, it can sit down, it can rest, it can be caught there. And yeah, um, I feel just like a, a medium here which facilitates this phenomena to settle down. It reminds me a lot of fascia or fascian in German, which is a sheet or band of fibrous connective tissue that separates or binds muscles and organs together or muscles and bones within the human body. And it's interesting to have this conversation with you because as a choreographer and someone working with the human body quite a lot, a lot of these processes which take place outside of the body in a creative process can also happen internally um, through the process of movement. And as you're explaining the light and definitely this haptic sensation of removing the soot where the light takes place and having contact with this tissue paper, which could also be like a, a fascia within the body or a membrane, as you've also described it as, it starts to really awaken the senses in terms of what is connected. You know, how can we bridge this rim of light and dark or the rim of a muscle to a bone or even the rim of a connection between a human and a stone, again, coming back to these more than human relations um, within our own body and outside. I often think of the more than human as also being within us. You know, when we think about the microbiomes that live on our skin or the density of bone that perhaps we don't consider human, um, mm -hmm. but we carry with a, a larger form which we call human so I think in going into these details and spending so much time with these objects and creating these processes externally it's uh yeah it's really creating this thick relation which I really appreciate Ollie yeah thank you so much this is um an interesting comparison for me also and uh, I mean many things can become like a membrane, just depending on the scale. Also, the wall here in front of me, it just can capture something on both sides, but for maybe other materials, it might be transparent. Mm. I want to jump forward now to 2022 and your work, The Topography of the Unseen, which I recently saw at Haunt Berlin, which was a 2.5 high by 3.6 meter wide, drawing on transparent paper yet again. And this drawing was of the dirt found on a cicada. I was really interested in this use again of the transparent paper and the process of creating this artwork in which you chose to focus on the dirt on the body or some form of resonance or remains um, and how that choice came about for you? Uh, yeah, this all came from a collaboration that I had with uh, two biologists in the Natural History Museum here in Berlin again. Um, but Now, this time, a completely different department than the, the mineral collection. Um, and we start um, the collaboration over that cicada that you manage, mentioned, which is a cicada only living on Hawaii in certain kind of caves. Its scientific name is Oliarus polyphemus. And that's also the title for that whole cycle of um, uh, projects. And I wanted to do from the beginning a thousandfold magnification of that animal. And uh, in that scale, 
start to researching on its surface structure. And to do so, uh, you have to use the electron microscope, which is very different thing than to a common light microscope. There you can't put on anything uh, easily uh, underneath and just look through and still having that physical connection that the thing that you're looking at is actually there in front of you. But for um, making something able to be observed in the uh, electron microscope, uh, it needs to have a very um, intense and difficult uh, pre-preparation. Yeah, to this, the object needs to be coated with some kind of metal, very uh, like just atoms thick layer. But anyway, has to be there because in the microscope it's going to be shot at with electrons, and that layer makes it able to reflect the electrons. And then you. Uh, put your specimen into a vacuum chamber or where this shooting with electrons is happening and you actually sitting next to that on a desk um, like a computer screen and having joysticks to navigate um, uh, over your object and you completely lose any physical connection. And um, in my residency that I had at the Natural History Mu Museum, I was able to use such an instrument and I made some hundreds of um, detail images from the cicada so that I could combine all those details into a collage um, which showed the whole animal in the um, in the dimension that we were aiming at, which were a thousand times magnifi mag magnified. And this already was a wall size image, but it still was a, um, yeah, it was a product um, from the machine, from the microscope, um, which is a technical image. And it's not having any own um, yeah um, interpretation in there yet because it's just produced by this machine and to be actually yeah an research result it needs somebody to read in that image and this is what I started doing with a series of drawing. And now coming back to the one yet that you mentioned that you saw in the exhibition, um, yeah, this it had to be this size um, because of the magnification. The cicada in original it's just three millimeters, but thousand times magnified, this become three meters. So now the cicada is there, big, like a hippo. And um, I always had many conversations with the scientists uh, at the beginning of the projects to learn about their way of looking at um, the image and the animal. And uh, over time, I found out that there is an aspect which were very obvious for me when I were looking at these, these images from the microscope, but which were completely overlooked by them. Um, when you look at the surface of the animal, how it is um, trans transported by the microscope, um, you see crumbles and fluff and like stuff lying on onto the skin all over the place. Um, and I found out that this feature, um, the I think the, the scientists for them that's not an yeah not an aspect of the animal itself, 
And so that's why they so sorted out from the beginning in their perception. And this was, of course, interesting to me because this, again, is an aspect of uh, extreme individuality. Um, this is uh, here, it's even more individualistic than the individual because this like dirt surface, it will be different in any second of the animal's life. It would change all the time. So the current state that we are now shown by um, the microscope is just like one single moment from the life of the cicada. And the drawing that I made um, uh, was focusing just on those layers, yeah, on the crumbles. Um, and I covered my big collage of microscopical images with a transparent material. This is this time it's a, another kind of um, material because it's actually a foil, not a paper. Um, and in, in this time, the transparent paper had also this practical aspect. So that I used uh, the transparent material that I can look through it and just draw on, on the place where I observe something from the microscopical image. So I covered the whole thing with this material and then I drew just those things yeah, that are supposedly on, on the surface of the cicada. And with my drawing, these, this layer of, so to speak, dirt, nobody can actually precisely know if this is actually dirt or maybe it still has a function for the, the animal. Um, and this layer, it comes off. If it lifts off and leaves the body behind. So what you saw, it seems like being the animal because you can still see all its anatomical forms. Um, it's a bit yeah, cloudy and um, with gaps, but you can have uh, the impression of being in front of this uh, wall size insect. <laughs> uh, but actually it's the drawing shows everything which is not the cicada. Mm. It's very interesting also for people that weren't able to experience this artwork that there are actually four large pieces of transparent sheet, as you're saying, Ollie, that when I experienced the artwork at Haunt was suspended on a grey wall and the dirt or this very fine filament, which Oli has chosen to capture in the drawing, is actually white. So for me, again, thinking about this contrast of light and dark, this, this dirt, which we often think of as kind of, yeah, earth or dark soil or dust, um, is captured as something very pure, actually, in the choice of the white drawing and it's the greyness behind the transparent sheet which really allow you to see the detail within this, this drawing. Um, this is always funny with when setting up that piece uh, because then I roll it out onto the floor and there's nothing on it and it just... Uh, comes out when being put in front of that dark background. Um, yeah, the the whiteness the, or the choice of using white was obvious from the beginning because um, the feature also in the way the microscope shows it, it seems more or less white or a bit grayish. But when looking at the actual animal, the, everything is white on, on it. Uh, the whole 
uh, animal is just almost whitish. Yeah? Um, and I also wanted to add um, that this was interesting um, during that process because when the scientists saw me drawing that, they started to realize of how much they left out here before in their perception. And um, they um, wanted to, you know, in the future, pay more attention um, onto what is actually there. And um, also we, yeah, we came up with like a almost philosophical question of where an uh, organism ends and where the environment starts here. And it became obvious, uh, at least with this feature, that in the microcosm, that boundary is, isn't a, a boundary um, anymore so precisely. And so it becomes like a blurry zone where things blend into each other. Mm. I think again we come into this topic of the edge, the edge of the shadow to light, the edge of the living organism to the non-living organism if the if the dirt in this case is dust or a filament. Um, yeah, so often in these edges are where the welding takes place. Ollie, as part of this podcast, I'm inviting guests to share a proposition with listeners and myself where we can embody your research. I think also coming from a choreographic background and dancing, I'm very interested in how we can experience knowledge in our bodies. Is there a process you could share with us where we can start to understand a little bit more of how you're creating these more than human relations? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, thanks for asking. I very much like to do that. And uh, also that uh, point with the edge uh, fits here very well. Uh, I want to propose a score which comes from my actual practice, which I also used to do um, at times. And I would say, I would call the exercise uh, the snailing eye. Uh, snail, the snail here, not uh, uh, especially because of being super slow, but because of a constant movement. I will explain that in, in a little bit. So uh, first I would ask the listeners to, if you have the chance to prepare a paper and a pencil, just having that ready on the side. Or if you're on the go somewhere you, that you can't do it, you can try later, but still you can join the exercise and do one part of it. So first, you close one eye and with doing that, all, uh, everything you see um, becomes more 2D already because the three-dimensional uh, impression is created by you having two eyes. Um, and you select a starting point in your field of vision um, and also simultaneously um, put your paper down onto a place on your paper. And now you not look at, onto your paper anymore. You hold it below your eye level, ideally, and you start following edges with your eyes. You um, do a path you do not jump uh, and you let your hand react simultaneously and also following a pass on the paper. So I say ready, set and go. And I keep uh, talking so yet do you have time doing that. Um, so when you're uh, here with us without paper, you can still 
experience, a way of looking, which is typical um, to drawing. We spoke about that, um, that when you now concentrate on edges, this can be the border of a form of an object that is there in front of you, but actually it's um, borders between contrasts, something lighter, Uh, touches something brighter and this creates the impression of uh, of an of an edge uh, this might be very different from the way a painter would look um, maybe uh, like this one would be uh, more concent concentrating on uh, areas and on colors of course but for drawing this um, way of looking is typical um, and also um, it becomes more interesting when you are actually drawing simultaneously um, while moving your eye um, because here you are mirroring yourself you do one movement with your eye and you mirror it with um, the movement of your hand. Rene, as a dance artist, might come up with something, but I cannot imagine any other way where one would be able to separate movements in one single body. Um, so, and you can also modify that exercise, um, concentrate on specific things that you pre-decide like just this pullover there on the chair or the leaves of the plant or whatever is uh, drawing your attention and you will notice with this scanning way of looking um, because you're constantly following a path details might come into your uh, awareness that you would, wouldn't notice otherwise with a more superficial um, way of looking uh, on, and onto the outside. So, and maybe now it's enough. Um, uh, you can stop the exercise and now for the first time look onto the paper which is always a big surprise how what happened there is actually looking because uh, for my experience it's always very different from what you expected, what it felt like. And, it, and it's also a surprise um, yeah, how that visual perception from the outside world can be transferred in a different way as it would be if you would uh, draw with uh, looking at, at the paper when you have that control aspect that you want to mimic the, the actual appearance. appearance. And uh, this way, the drawing that happened, it becomes, um, as I see it, more like a protocol of that a performance of your eye that you did because it's for me it's a, a performance because you move your eye in a methodological way you beforehand decide of how you want to move it now that's my exercise Hmm. Thank you so much. What a gift. Um, I have a an A4 white sheet of paper, so I was able to follow with a pen. And um, yeah, it's very interesting what parts of the room take my attention. I was very excited about paintings on the wall, actually, which I've never tried to interpret. <laughs> um, physically so I realize 
Yeah, it's not quite to scale also, like the things that take my attention take up a lot of the page and yeah. some larger objects like the couch are quite small. Um, so it's a, a really nice exercise also in scale and attention, which I think also has been an ongoing theme in this episode, how we choose to look at things and what we choose to look at and, um, yeah, the details. Yeah, that's great that you did it. And also this exercise, it can be a first approach to drawing because it um, yeah, it avoids the, yeah, the, the fear of getting it wrong mm -hmm. because there isn't that correctional uh, response. Mm. And you can be surprised how easy it is to just let your hand move. Totally. Oli, you're the first part of Series 11. And as the way this podcast is moving forward is that you will pass the microphone on to somebody who has influenced your world, a human companion, and we'll speak with them in episode 11.2. Can you introduce your next uh, speaker to listeners? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I selected uh, Daniel Hengst as the new, um, the next participant. And he was there in, uh, yeah, in a parallel exhibition at Haunt uh, to the one that you mentioned with the, the big cicada in. And His work is about plants and, um, yeah, working with them uh, in di di digital, yeah, virtual imagery. Um, but I won't tell more. Um, it's just um, that I wanted to pass the mic on to him because I liked uh, our meeting in the exhibition already so much that... Uh, For me, it was a great uh, opportunity to even extend our yeah, connection here that way. Mm. I had the pleasure of having a conversation with Daniel in preparation for next episode. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about his practice. And there is definitely a connection there. Thank you so much, Oli, for this conversation and your time and sharing your practice with us. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure and good luck for the next episodes then. <laughs> thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Worlding Podcast. Gefördert durch die Beauftragte der Bundesregierung für Kultur und Medien im Programm Neustart Kultur. Hilfsprogramm des Tanzen des Dachverband Tanz Deutschland.